Welcome to Heart and Brain Disease in Women, everyone, Sex and Gender Connections. My name is Sharon Begley. I'm the senior science writer at STAT and the moderator of today's program. So let's get right to it. I will introduce today's panelists. Um, starting on my immediate right is Marjorie Jenkins, director of medical initiatives and scientific engagement at the Food and Drug Administration Office of Women's Health. Next to her is Jill Goldstein, professor of psychiatry and medicine at Harvard Medical School and executive director of the Women, Heart and Brain Global Initiative at Massachusetts General Hospital. Next, we have Anna Langer, professor of the practice of public health and director of the Women and in Health Initiative at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And last but not least, British Robinson, chief executive officer of the Women's Heart Alliance. We are streaming live on the websites of the forum and STAT. We're also streaming on Facebook. As always with forum events, we have questions and answers at the end from our studio audience, as well as from those of you watching remotely. <coughs> you can email questions to the forum, one word, at hsph.harvard.edu. You can also participate in a live chat that's happening on the forum website right now. So you may know that February is American Heart Month and next week brings International Women's Day. So it seems fitting that we're discussing heart and brain disease in women, sex and gender connections. The idea that disease symptoms can manifest differently in men and women is not new. Only recently, however, have these differences been getting incorporated in a serious and concerted way into study designs and evaluations. One of our topics today is how seriously and how concerted those efforts have been. Um, we know that sex and gender differences play particularly important roles in diseases of the brain and heart, um, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, depression, and the long list of others. Um, researchers are also learning about how brain and heart diseases are linked to one another. To get our conversation started, let's take a look at a clip from the Women's Heart Alliance, thank you, British, um, about heart disease, which is so often misdiagnosed in women. My name is Yvonne Cowan. I was very shocked. I was nervous. I do not have any family history of heart attack. There was fire inside, like there was a torch lit inside of my chest. The first thing that came to my mind, this is it. Nothing was showing in the blood test to say that, you know, this was in fact what was happening. So they were now treating me as though I had indigestion. And after they repeated the test, they came back like about an hour or so later and they said to me, you are not going anywhere tomorrow. You actually had a heart attack. Prior to that, I thought I was the epitome of good health. I was a vegan for a number of years. I never ate junk food. I would eat fried food, fried food like plantains and stuff because that's my culture. Since my heart attack, my advice from my doctor was to walk. Women, when we have that kind of thing, they don't, they don't realize that, you know, it could be something. Do not leave the, the hospital until they do like thorough check, um, testing, thorough. You know, repeat the test. Go with your first instinct. So her blood test did not show that she had a heart disease, uh, a heart attack. Um, Marjorie, um, let me start with you. If you could put this into context for us. Um, heart disease is the number one killer of both men and women <coughs> in the U.S., yet as we just saw with Yvonne, women are more likely to be misdiagnosed when seeking help. Um, if you could just sort of reel off what the what sex differences and or gender differences, and, and please um, explain to us the difference, are in play here. What, what, which ones are relevant? Um, why are they important to consider? Well, we have sex and gender influences in our health across our lifespan. Um, if we know that these two terms are unique, sex is your chromosome, DM, DNA, anatomy, physiology, um, it is a biological variable. But 
Gender is a social construct. Gender is how our environment and society interacts with us based on how we present to our society and environment. So how does that uh, play in Yvonne's story? Well, women tend to lay down plaque in their arteries in a different way than men. We tend to lay down smoother plaque that's sometimes harder to diagnose during heart catheterization. We also may present more often with these, quote, atypical symptoms. They're called atypical because the typical was defined on the male norm. And so when women present with burning, uh, or uh, back pain or jaw pain, they're often triaged in a different way in the emergency room. So a woman comes in, she's anxious, she has heartburn, she has back pain, she's questioned, she tells the doctor she's tired, she's really nervous, so the doctor thinks that she's having a panic attack or that she's depressed, and therefore she gets medication for that. Those medications will not treat a heart attack. She needs to be screened for heart disease. So that's just one you know, microcosm of really how sex and gender interplay across <coughs> our, uh, our uh, medical care. And so um, from the FDA standpoint and where I look at health policy, health policy is so impactful to sex and gender differences. The growth in policy changes over the last two decades has been enormous. In 2016, NIH passed a, a policy and an in, enacted a policy that researchers would study both sexes of cells and tissues and organs and humans and not only that, but they would analyze the data. That was a game changer, and it will cause a ripple e effect through biomedical research for decades to come. The Office of Women's Health at the FDA, where, where I am a part of, we fund mm -hmm. research to help make regulatory decisions for drugs and devices. We also educate FDA researchers and reviewers on emerging sex differences that are important to know as we're approving drugs for use in both men and women. And in 2014, the Center for um, Drug Evaluation and Research created a consumer site that you may like to visit called Drug Trial Snapshots. And this will tell you who participated in clinical trials. Were they like you? Men, women, age, race, ethnicity, and if they found any, any differences among those groups. So policies like these have a great ripple effect. Awareness has a great ripple effect. And I think that, that it's important that we begin to integrate this across not only policy, but medical education, pharmacy, and also into the mainstream media so that, that women and men are more aware of their health care needs. Thank you. Um, Jill, um, tell us some more about that, please. Um, how can understanding sex, again, sex and gender differences, help with the prevention and treatment of the, the major chronic diseases of the heart and brain? Well, major depression and heart disease are the number one and two primary causes of disability worldwide. And women are at twice the risk for major depression. And heart disease, as you heard, it is the number one killer of women in the United States and in most middle-income countries. And major depression and heart disease, they co-occur really frequently, over 20% in the population. <clears throat> and that co-occurrence, or what we call comorbidity, will be the number one cause of disability worldwide. Women are at twice the risk for the comorbidity or co-occurrence of major depression and cardiovascular disease. And both major depression and cardiovascular disease are independent risk factors for memory decline later in life and Alzheimer's disease. And we know that women have a much higher frequency of Alzheimer's disease. And we now know, or are coming to know better, that it is not only because women live longer. So understanding the causes of some of these sex differences we believe are shared across these disorders and what we are um, uh, embarking upon uh, with a new initiative, which I'll tell you in a moment, is to try to use that knowledge to translate it into novel, novel therapeutics and healthcare systems. Now, we have no effective treatments for the comorbidity of these disorders. And if we do not 
find these treatments, they will tank either our or certainly our children's economy. So in the service of tackling three of the major public health challenges of our time, major depression, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, we have launched a new initiative called the Women, Heart, and Brain Global Initiative. This is a collaboration of Massachusetts General Hospital and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and we're partnering with the Women's Heart Alliance and with Women Against Alzheimer's. And our, our goals are threefold. One is to enhance the discovery of sex differences that really cross these disorders. So shared causes, shared pathophysiology, enhance our discovery, then translate that discovery. Translate the discovery into novel therapeutics that incorporate our understanding of these sex differences that cross these diseases. But not only therapeutics, thinking about our healthcare systems differently. We generally think about healthcare within departments, within silos, within disorders. We are launching this initiative to actually think across these disorders, shared pathophysiology, and we believe that an understanding of the sex differences will provide insights into that. And finally, education, educating the next generation who are going into medicine and educating the public about the importance of the impact of sex on what we now are terming personalized, individualized, precision medicine. Because as I've said before, what could be more personal than one's sex? I want to drill down into this a little bit more later, but just before um, we go on, Jill, let me ask you, um, what do we know about the sex differences? So as you said, <coughs> al Alzheimer's disease has a much higher frequency in women than in men, and not only because women live longer. Just give us a teeny little preview of what we think might be behind that sex difference in frequency? In Alzheimer's or in Alzheimer's, across? In Alzheimer's specifically. In Alzheimer's. Well, there are a number of studies that have looked both at the hormonal regulation of uh, some of the key um, signs and um, a pathology behind Alzheimer's, which is the buildup of amyloid and plaques. And that's how we make these diagnoses. So one of the things that have been found is that there is an estradiol and a hormonal regulation of, um, of the buildup and accumulation of amyloid. We also know that the E4 allele uh, of the um, uh, APOE uh, genotype um, and its E4 allele is one of the primary risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and we also know the expression of that allele actually differs in men and women. So those are two. But the third thing which I think is also important is that disorders like depression, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, metabolic syndrome, that are independent risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, memory decline, all of those disorders show sex differences. And so this initiative and, and, and really tackling, tackling Alzheimer's disease, again, through that lens, we believe will actually tackle a number of these disorders. That's really together. fascinating, thank you. Um, Anna, let me move on to you. Um, um, we, we've heard just brief mention of um, some of the, the global um, uh, data, um, disease incidents, et cetera. Um, tell us how some of the differences that have been alluded to do play out globally, not just in a well-resourced um, Western population in particular. Thank you. More than three quarters of premature deaths globally are due to cardiovascular disease and other NCDs, which is something that people are not too often aware of. NCDs are non-communicable uh, diseases. non-communicable mm -hmm. diseases. We are so jargony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, in spite of that evidence, uh, these diseases get little evidence, uh, little <coughs> attention from governments, policymakers, uh, donors, the public is not aware uh, of them. Uh, and uh, well, definitely that needs to uh, change because the burden of disease, the, the problems that are causing more deaths and disability are changing now. They are not anymore reproductive health issues or infectious diseases or malnutrition as they used to be uh, some years ago, but rather non-communicable diseases. Uh, so that awareness and attention is uh, slowly changing, but still uh, weak health systems in low resource settings are uh, struggling uh, to take care of uh, people, women in particular, uh, who, sh uh, who have the burden of uh, the traditional, uh, if you uh, will, 
conditions uh, like maternal health um, complications and reproductive health complications. And at the same time, there is this tsunami of non-communicable diseases uh, that is affecting uh, women. And often they don't connect the dots. As Jill was saying, they address these issues in a siloed way. Uh, and that's a, a missed opportunity in many uh, ways, but let me highlight one uh, way because this is an important missed opportunity. Many of the conditions that happen during pregnancy, like gestational diabetes, for instance, increase significantly the risk of type 2 diabetes later in life, or uh, hypertensive disorders, a uh, high blood pressure during pregnancy, also uh, increases the risk of chronic hypertension later in life or postpartum depression increases the risk of chronic depression uh, later in life. So the, the care that women get uh, during pregnancy is a perfect window uh, to educate them, uh, to let them know about the risk factors they need to uh, be aware of, and to connect them with the health system in the long term so they get the care they need uh, when necessary. So the sort of the, the positive, the flip side of how um, non-communicable diseases are uh, becoming an ever-increasing burden in uh, poorly resourced countries, the, the flip side of that is there has been amazing success against infectious diseases. Um, what I'm wondering is, um, before I get to British, is do, do you have any sense um, of whether the, the strategies that succeeded, not completely, but um, to some extent, against infectious diseases, are those and by strategies, I don't mean specifically medical mm -hmm. ones, but public policies, social policies, social change perhaps. Um, is there any sense, any optimism that those might also be the sort of way in for non-communicable diseases? Well, some of them will uh, because uh, stronger health systems are better equipped to deal with a wide range of issues. But in other ways, uh, the, the progress that has been made with infectious diseases won't necessarily help with non-communicable diseases because there are no magic bullets for non-communicable diseases as they are for some infectious diseases, luckily. Yeah. So it's more a matter of changing lifestyles. Uh, it's a matter of increasing the ability of the health system to screen and detect early and, of course, treat some of those conditions. And uh, they are very, very different from infectious diseases. Right. I mean, devastating as infectious diseases are, it just sounds like it will be a much heavier lift for some of the things that we're describing. Well, let, let, we can get back to that, but let me mm -hmm. um, turn to you, British. Um, your organization produced the clip that we saw. Thank you. Um, how can um, the information that Yvonne conveyed um, be used to help pr prevent disease um, in, the first in the first place, um, brain as well as heart? Um, and how can research be applied to help women, something that Marjorie alluded to. Sure, well thank you. On this last uh, day of Women's Heart Month, um, it's unfortunate and it's all too often that Yvonne's story is really too common. Um, and that's why it's the number one killer. And I think first and foremost, we share stories like Yvonne's on our website and through social media um, so that women can make a personal connection. We know from evidence, from data, that that personal connection helps us change behaviors and thereby educating, helping empower women to educate themselves um, around the unique risk factors, um, but also around the signs and symptoms, as we discussed a little bit earlier, things like pregnancy complications that women simply aren't aware of. Um, I think at the Women's Heart Alliance, we're laser focused that men and women are not the same, that they are different, and that we understand that additional funding um, for research related to those sex differences, that will mean different and better outcomes, health outcomes, but also different interventions around prevention, care, and treatment. We think that's absolutely critical. Um, the awareness piece is also critical, but I wanna bring in something that Marjorie mentioned, those social, um, mm -hmm. behavioral, environmental, social determinants of health matter. We will not succeed if we we will not succeed with all of our wonderful scientific advances if we don't bring in these questions and understand better what's going on in her life. So gender matters, that social construct actually matters if we're gonna see better health outcomes in the future. And specifically, look, CVD is 80% preventable. So if we go upstream and figure out um, what we can do, if we can figure out those barriers to get her into care and treatment, but also to raise awareness around prevention so that we can actually prevent this and we're not running downstream as, we are, as we're doing now. 
Um, so that's absolutely critical. And we believe by tying these two pieces together, the scientific advances, the social determinants of health, recognizing those, those barriers that we'll actually see better health outcomes and that we'll see better modes of prevention um, so that we can save more lives in the future. So when I hear awareness, I think public awareness, you know, everyone. But as we heard um, from Yvonne, she went to the hospital, blood test, no heart attack, go have a nice walk, my dear. Mm -hmm. um, so surely by awareness, you're also referring to um, doctors, mm -hmm. nurses, the, this universe we Absolutely. call healthcare providers. How is that going and, and why, I'm sorry to ask the naive question, why is that necessary? Have these people not right. gone to right. medical school? Right, so that's a tough nut to crack. So education and awareness on every level with every sector. Um, so we wanna go beyond the individual woman and just changing her behavior, but we have to take a whole of systems approach. That system includes our medical and clinical systems, hospital systems, it includes our physicians, our nurses, our community health workers. And that means for us at the Women's Heart Alliance, we're very proud that we partnered with Weill Cornell and created a, a module, if you will, around women's cardiovascular disease, and we hope to get that out um, over this next year. We hope other medical schools will join us and try to, um, and try to uh, implement that module in year one um, so that our physicians are aware. Currently in the US, our medical schools do not teach what we call female pattern heart disease. Um, and we wanna make folks more aware of that, particularly the clinicians, so that a woman is not sit home with a Prilosec or she just has indigestion or what have you, so that we can truly save more lives when she shows up at the ER. This is one of those moments when I have to pinch myself and remind me my, myself that it's 2018. Marjorie, were you just trying to jump in there? Yeah. Or Okay, um, so uh, obviously I have to restrain myself from asking even more questions <laughs> because we have to keep going here. Um, so uh, as, as we've heard, um, sex and gender differences are crucial to um, understanding women's health and improving it. Um, one way to address the gap that our panelists have uh, laid out for us is getting more representation of women in clinical research and clinical trials. Um, we have another clip um, um, from patients and the NIH staff about why this matters, um, and this comes to us courtesy of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. I was just fortunate enough to you know, participate with the NIH um, stem cell research. I'm very, very grateful for going through this clinical trial. Um, and I will do it all over again in a heartbeat. So I've worked at the Clinical Center for almost 30 years. And as a woman working here, first as a nurse and now managing patient safety for the hospital, I think it's so important that we as women participate in clinical trials and other research projects because what we're doing here today will inform healthcare and medicine in 10 or 20 years. So from a female perspective, I want my voice heard for my granddaughter in 20 years and so that the care that she gets 25 years from now by her local general practitioner has been informed by research that was done in partnership with women. So. I encourage women to participate in, in clinical research. Um, it's safe, it's important, um, and it's what you wanna do for your daughters, your granddaughters, your nieces, uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now. If people ask me why I'd consider a clinical trial, I think um, beyond just being part of something that's helping further science, it's just about keeping that piece of hope alive to, believe that there's a possibility that something new could work, that there's some treatment out there that um, could have hope, and um, to hold on to that. Every woman should learn about clinical research and what it can do for you, your family, and your community. So, um, Marjorie, separate us out for us, if you would. So women are not participating in clinical trials in the numbers, I think, that men are, or at least not in the numbers that we wish they were. Um, mm -hmm. But is that because they don't want to, or what is going on there? Okay. Well, the good news is we have seen a dramatic increase of women in clinical trials uh, over the past decade, both the FDA and uh, data from NIH, National Institutes of Health. So women are participating. 
uh, one of the issues is that the data is not being analyzed. If you get the data, but you don't analyze it by sex, you won't know the difference. You won't be able to determine whether there is a real difference. So, um, so that's the good news. Women are participating. But in some diseases, heart disease, they are still underrepresented. Even though men and women have heart disease at the same, at parity. So 50-50. So what are, what are the issues there? Well, some of it are, are those gender aspects, so those social aspects. People think women are too busy. They're caregivers. They won't be able to make the appointments. They won't complete the trial. Um, family members are too protective of mom or grandma to allow them to enter a clinical trial. And then there are the biological issues where we think that women might have more adverse income, uh, out, adverse outcomes. And so we may, uh, women may be sicker at presentation in the emergency room. And therefore, they may not be enrolled in a clinical trial because of other issues around that. So actually, it's a myth of epic proportions that women will not participate in clinical trials because we know that uh, studies show that if they're asked, women will participate they will complete the trial, and sometimes at higher rates than their male counterparts. So why is this important? Well, if we don't have the data, we can't get the answer, right? So we want women to know, to be advocates for <coughs> themselves. We want their healthcare providers to know, to, to talk with women about participating in clinical trials. And then we want to have a large public awareness campaign about uh, women in clinical trials. So for instance, our office launched a diverse women in clinical trials campaign in 2016. We've reached millions, but we want women to participate for themselves and for women like them. We need women of color. We need women of different backgrounds. We need women of different ages. We need to know those answers for all women and all men. So that's why it's very important to participate so we can have those answers and treat patients to the highest level of care. I'm fascinated by your point that even when women do participate in a clinical trial, um, the, the analysis is not always or not right. necessarily done um, by, by sex. So if the clinical trial we're mm -hmm. talking about is um, a registration trial mm -hmm. for a new um, pharmaceutical, mm -hmm. can't mm -hmm. FDA mm -hmm. say, go away until you've done this or you don't get your drug approved? I mean, what is FDA's role in um, bringing about yeah. the kind of change that you're outlining here? Well, thanks for teeing me up for that. That's Sharon, my job. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, in 1993, FDA passed a guidance to industry about reporting uh, gender, race, and age in new drug applications and investigational new drug applications. That's 1993. In 1998, we had the mandated demographic rule so every sponsor that comes in with an investigational new drug or new drug application has to report sex slash gender, um, age, and race ethnicity. And for new drug applications, they must analyze the data by sex. So that's important. But FDA just doesn't take that bolus of data, look at the spreadsheets, and approve a product. It's a one-year process with uh, over a dozen uh, professionals, pharmacotox uh, experts, clinical reviewers. They look at that data. They then look at the sub-analysis again. And then they report that in the label if there are clinically meaningful differences. So the drug trial snapshots that I told you about, they list who was in the trial, and they also list statements around those age, gender, race, ethnicity, if there were differences noted in the clinical trial. So you can go and look up a drug if it was approved from 2014. So actually, FDA is very committed to sex analysis. And, and what we want to do is raise awareness of this fast-moving, emerging knowledge of sex differences that we must have in order to better make decisions for product approval. Okay. And, and Jill, of course, it's not just the, the formal cl mm -hmm. clinical trials. There's lots of research that's not <coughs> clinical trials. What, what kind of women's representation and analysis of the data um, are we seeing there? And if we're falling short, how might that gap be bridged? 
So I'd just like to make two points to, to compliment uh, Dr. Jenkins. Uh, one is there is a history of, uh, with women in clinical trials, for example, around uh, women who are still premenopausal and uh, the fear of pregnancy and things like that. So that there are addressing, their, that, that these issues are addressed uh, when we do research with women who are still of childbearing years. And I think there's a long history that something uh, legal or litigious issues um, that really was one of the forces that um, was a force against kind of bringing in younger women into clinical trials. But I want to make the other point, which is that um, that when we do research, either whether it's clinical trials or really clinical research, not just trials, but research in general on human beings, that we need to design our studies to incorporate a very complicated variable, which is sex and gender. And we need to understand what the complicated um, aspects of that variable is. It's not just you know, chromosomal. Um, and so that's a very important point, that if you do not design your studies with that in mind, that even in the analysis of the data, you may not find a sex difference. Because some of the things we've been talking about now really differ depending on where the woman is in her menstrual cycle, whether the woman is postmenopausal or not. Those are just some of the issues. So this is a, a, a really um, critical point about uh, incorporating sex and gender into designs of, of human studies in general. So people are hard. Um, mice, you would think, would be easier. Um, so one of the risks of talking to a reporter, of course, is that for a reporter, everything <laughs> is a story. Um, so before we came out here, we were just chatting informally. So Marjorie, I will just put you on the spot yet again, <laughs> yeah. because you told us about um, a preclinical study. Those would be in mice. Mm -hmm. And this sounded mm -hmm. like a fascinating um, study of polycystic ovary disease. Did I say ovary disease? Mm -hmm. Could you just tell us briefly about that study? Yes, it was, a, it was an article that was sent to me by a uh, research scholar. <laughs> a Birch scholar and and uh, she said dr. Jenkins I saw this and I really wanted to share it with you because it was research about um, in polycystic ovary syndrome you get intolerant to glucose so you get sort of a picture of prediabetes or frank diabetes so they were looking at an animal model to try to determine why we were getting resistant to insulin um, and to treat which we uh, treat your glucose levels in your bloodstream Okay, so um, she said, and I noticed that the animals were all male for this, for this model. They couldn't, have ovary, get, they couldn't get female mice to volunteer. Polycystic <laughs> ovary disease. I'm not sure what the female mice were doing, actually. They were, they were tied they up. Were like, they were over they here were watching. They were running to daycare. Yeah, yes. exactly. They were taking care of the little ones. Yes. <laughs> So there you have it. Um, um, Jill, before I let you uh, go on, before I move on to Anna, um, um, you, you talked about the importance of um, a, a lifetime perspective, as you said, sir. Um, the premenopausal, just throughout the, uh, the uh, pregnancy uh, ages, et cetera, for women. Um, uh, tell us a little bit more about that, um, especially in terms of um, how sex differences in some of the things that we've been taking off manifest and their origins way back, mm -hmm. maybe even mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in utero. Mm -hmm. Well, depression, cardiovascular disease, even Alzheimer's disease actually have early origins, early vulnerabilities. Even the aging of the brain is also about development of the brain. And so really taking a lifespan perspective <coughs> about understanding these illnesses is actually very critical. So for example, uh, if you're gonna identify a sex effect, timing is everything. And so we have these naturalistic windows of opportunity to actually study when sex differences will be revealed. And that's when the brain and the body are either differentially flooded with gonadal hormones, estradiol, testosterone, or depleted of gonadal hormones like in menopause. And that's in fetal development, in puberty, pregnancy, where you can compare age match men, and in, in menopause. And this allows us to really look for early emergence of sex differences really across the lifespan. Because believe it or not, Alzheimer's disease actually has some early fetal origins. And some of those fetal origins are actually shared with depression 
and with cardiovascular disease and the development of the vasculature. So if we do understand these early critical periods, these early sensitive periods, we will be able to develop therapeutics to target kind of when and where and the timing in order to attenuate disability later or hopefully eventually prevent some of these illnesses altogether. Um, British, let me jump to you. So you mentioned mm -hmm. your um, Wild Cornell initiative, but um, you guys also have um, a Nashville mm -hmm. program. Um, tell us, please, about um, what that's about um, and how it's going. Sure, thank you for that. Um, essentially, what we wanted to do is, is take the science and, and bring it to ground. Um, so in February of last year, we launched um, in Nashville, Tennessee, um, an initiative, collective impact initiative, called Cities and Communities with Heart. Um, it's a multi-sectoral, multi-factoral, multi-partner um, initiative where we brought an entire community together um, to look at a single disease, in this case, women's cardiovascular disease. How could we, in one city, look at all of the partners, all of, from community-based organizations to faith-based organizations to federally qualified health clinics um, to some of the hospital systems and schools of nursing? We came up with five interventions one I'll mention today, which is about really meeting women where they are. Again, it goes back to what Marjorie was mentioning earlier, but also those social, environmental, and behavioral factors that we believe will affect health outcomes. In order to make those health outcomes more improved, we need to address those. And so, for example, um, meeting her where she is is where she lives, works, plays, and prays. And we have one initiative um, called uh, Caring for the Caregiver, um, where we've partnered with a number of the hospital systems in Nashville to support and educate nurses. We know that nurses make up 90% of our workforce. They're often engaged in stressful um, shift work where they're more at risk for cardiovascular disease risk factors. And believe it or not, they themselves as clinicians don't know all the risk factors. They don't know the unique signs and symptoms for women. We believe that if you educate a nurse that we will see more improved health outcomes. And I like to say the analogy is this. When you get on the plane with your baby, the stewardess says, put on your, if the plane is going down, put on your mask first and then put on your child's. We believe by empowering those nurses on the ground in Nashville that we will see improved health outcomes within the hospital systems there. We've only just started, but we are quite hopeful um, that by educating a nurse that we begin to make a healthier population and we reduce morbidity and mortality in Nashville amongst women around cardiovascular disease. Just one stat to share with you. For every one woman in Nashville um, that has breast cancer, eight have cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's a quite a serious problem, um, but yet a lot of good things are happening in Nashville. And if we feel like if we can prove something and achieve something there, that possibly it can be replicated elsewhere. Cool. Um, on a, uh, again, if you're, you're our um, global perspective panelist. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about whether um, fiscal policies, tobacco taxes, I mean, all the things that are being rolled out in some countries, but certainly not all of them, um, are, they, um, are they being widely adopted? Are they having an, well, maybe we don't know yet if they're having an impact, but is the, um, the, the gender disparity in uh, the brain and heart diseases that we're talking about, is that an important incentive for the governments to take some of these steps that they are or are not taking? Yeah, uh, let me uh, start by saying something about risk factors for cardiovascular disease uh, in low and middle income countries. I mean, uh, and the difference by sex. Uh, we know that smoking is increasing much more rapidly among women in those countries than among men. Uh, we know that urbanization and other changes in the social environment are contributing to overweight and obesity, both for men and women. But we also know that the rates of obesity are uh, higher uh, among women. And uh, while well, Jill mentioned before uh, anxiety and depression, uh, we also know that self-harm, including suicide, for instance, uh, is the top cause of death among uh, adolescent girls in developing countries. So uh, whatever fiscal policies governments put in place, they should have uh, women as very, very clear uh, targets. 
If that's happening or not, it's difficult to evaluate because, well, the policies uh, exist in many places. There are 80 percent of countries around the world, including developing countries, have adopted uh, double, uh, the World Health Organization's uh, policies on uh, tobacco products and restriction of advertising and all the, the, the increasing uh, taxes, all the policies that we know work, uh, but very few are enforcing them. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in countries like India and China that obviously have huge populations, uh, we know that those policies, uh, well, are there on paper but have not been enforced. There are some countries that are now uh, introducing a taxation on sweetened beverages that, uh, well, is another intervention that uh, has, uh, in fact, it has been evaluated in Mexico and it works. And now there are other countries that are doing it, but still definitely not at the rate they should, uh, both uh, in, in, on paper and uh, in practice. Uh, so much, much more uh, needs to be done uh, in countries where regulations are not as strict as we would like them to be. We're going to turn to questions in just a few minutes, but Anna, if I can stay with you for just a second. Um, so Marjorie explained to us the difference between sex and gender and sex and gender effects on the diseases that we're talking about. Um, you alluded briefly to how, and particularly gender effects, the social construct and how it manifests in a particular society um, might feed into uh, these diseases through the risk factors that being a person of this gender in the society might cause you. Could you just give a, uh, us a few examples of, of the gender, the specifically gender influence on um, heart and brain diseases? I mean, are women, w women I don't know, shop more than men in many countries? Are uh, stress levels, you have mentioned that women, are, the rate of increase mm -hmm. in smoking is greater in women. That sounds obviously like a gender effect. Are there other things that are in play there that policymakers need to know about? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, first, let me say that, well, Marjorie very clearly explained the difference between sex and gender. Uh, people still use the terms sometimes interchangeably, if that's a word, and we shouldn't. And that's something I tell my students always. Sex is a biological variable, and gender, as uh, Marjorie very clearly explained, uh, is a social construct, so different things. Uh, yeah, smoking is a good example, uh, I, I think, of the influence of gender. Uh, in many places, uh, young women associate smoking with some kind of glamour, uh, some kind of sex appeal. Uh, obviously, uh, tobacco companies use that in their adver advertising and have a strong influence on women's adoption of uh, smoking as a habit. Sometimes it, it's both. It's, it's sex, but it's also gender it, it coming together uh, to uh, determine an, a, an outcome. And let me use uh, not a non-communicable disease, but rather maternal health as an example. Obviously, only women get pregnant, so maternal health is an issue that only affects women. Uh, but in places where women are undervalued, where they don't have the autonomy to make decisions or the means to uh, implement them, and those are gender issues, uh, well, both the <coughs> biological medical complications and their, the barriers they face to uh, access the care they need uh, come together to determine a poor outcome for themselves or for their babies. So uh, yeah, it's oh, a synergistic okay. uh, uh, well, thank you. Influence. Um, so, surprise, surprise, we are not going to get through all the topics that our <laughs> panelists are prepared to talk about. Um, I'm going to go to questions in one second, but I just have to ask, in case none, no one in the audience does, a question of Jill. Um, are there um, sex dependent or sex, um, sex dependent therapeutics? We've been talking about the influences on diseases, risk factors, et cetera. Are there sex dependent therapeutics? Well, I'm very glad you asked that question um, because uh, one of the major goals of the Women, Heart, and Brain Global Initiative is to translate discovery 
into therapeutics. We're calling them sex-dependent therapeutics. Now, what does that mean? It means that there may be times in which dosages may differ, and those dosages that differ may not be just due to weight, for example. They may actually be due to, for example, how certain neurotransmitters, you know, chemicals that help talk between one nerve cell and another, neurotransmitters actually may act differently and have a different distribution in the male and female brain. So perhaps there are dosage differences, but also we may find pharmaceuticals, for example, that may be completely different. And I think uh, I was talking to Dr. Jenkins uh, the other day, and I believe there may be only one or three, a f only a few uh, drugs that are approved by the FDA that have any sort of sex dependency associated with them. And uh, there's been a history of, of companies um, resistant to it, in part because they think, well, we're going to make a drug for, for only half the population. On the other hand, um, they probably have a lot of molecules that are sitting uh, in their um, armamentarium that actually don't work when you use them on men and women of certain ages. And actually, they uh, may be actually quite effective in one sex than another. So really kind of um, creating an education and an awareness about the importance of incorporating these things into <coughs> your models and also using male and female animals uh, that... Even for um, ovary disease? <laughs> 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 well, we won't go one. that far. <laughs> no, won't it's go fascinating. That far. <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, so as promised, um, and finally, um, uh, Lisa, do we have any questions from our remote audience? We do, and um, actually we've had a, no a number of questions coming in on the role of toxic stress. So I'll start with that. Um, this is from Sheila Rao, who is Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine and Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Esteemed panelists, do you feel that one of the reasons explaining the dis disproportionate increased risk of cardiometabolic disease in women can be accounted for by epigenetic alterations accumulated from ACEs. Do you feel that being female puts you at risk of acquiring more ACEs in your lifetime? By the way, ACEs I are I adverse childhood experiences. experiences or exposure, so trauma in childhood. Um, I don't know whether, well, I'll just take one quick stab at this. Um, <laughs> As I said, you know, over, over the course of the lifetime, there are different exposures uh, uh, that actually influence both uh, the development of the brain and the body differentially, uh, and adverse childhood exposures, traumas, sexual, physical, um, even exposures like air pollution and other kind of chemical exposures, environmental exposures, these actually can have differential effects on the development of the brain and the body at different periods of development. Uh, and uh, they have been found to be significantly associated with the risk for obesity, the risk for metabolic syndrome, which is, and, and the risk for um, actually the development of the vasculature in certain, in certain brain regions, and of course the risk uh, for major depression as well. Thank you. I mean, we have had a number of those questions, and so I, mm. I did mm. want to start with that one. Um, I'll do another one here. I think this uh, may be for you, Anna. Given the huge impacts you have discussed in the developing mm. world, what can we do to be sure women there are included in this research on sex differences and potential therapies for NCDs? Are there programs in place in developing countries to do this that could be replicated? Yeah, th there are some. I know about some universities in Africa and definitely in Latin America that are doing uh, research that involves uh, gender as a, a sex, sorry, now I made a mistake, mm -hmm. <laughs> sex as a biological variable. But of course the research capacity in many of those settings is quite limited. So I think it's a matter of policies using evidence coming from local institutions, but also from uh, developed countries uh, where uh, research is more robust uh, and use them for their own policy. So it's a matter of translating the evidence, regardless of where it comes from, uh, into policies and actions. Great, thank you. And of course, if there are questions in the studio audience, just wave your hand and we'll bring a mic to you. Um, Lisa, do we have any more from We do. Does ahead? anyone in the studio audience want to ask a question? Hi. 
Um, thank you for this fa fascinating talk. Um, my name is Catherine Kurtzoulis, and I'm a, um, a researcher in cardiovascular disease studying sex and gender differences um, from my master's degree, actually, all the way through my postdoc. Um, and now um, I have two clinical trials, two international clinical trials that is that are actually studying angina differences in uh, men and women. Um, <clears throat> One of my focuses has been understanding the gender piece. Um, and the gender piece, to me, I found a lot of um, um, nuances in the language that women use versus the language that men use when they show up in the ER with their cardiac symptoms or even in the um, in the in the doctor's office and so I'm you know looking at um, the way the language that women use uh, which is different and that is an, a very clear gender component um, I've had patients I've got my clinical trial going on right now at the Brigham I have patients, I had a patient in the summertime from the south and she was describing her, her chest pain, the, the patients are about to go in for their cath and she was saying my heart is itching and I was like itching, like I don't, I don't, I've heard so many terms I haven't heard that, you know, and indeed this woman had, you know, triple vessel disease, she went on for, uh, for a, a bypass after, but there seems to be like so many opportunities to explore this and explode this. Um, one of the ways that I teach about gender is that, you know, my sex is the same no matter where I go in the world, but my gender might be, you know, my role, my gender role might be very perceived very differently by myself and by society in different parts of the world. And so likewise, the language might travel along with it and all the other um, components that go with it. Um, and I think that you know, where, where is the FDA on this? I know that women are still very underrepresented in cardiac clinical trials. I believe I saw some numbers in um, 2012, they represent 27% despite the Revitalization Act in 1993. Oh. Okay. So I know that there's, yeah, there's there are some problems. So me, we need to uh, work our way take, off. I'm yeah. going to very quickly take that, uh, that that question. First and foremost, about communication, gender communication, gendered communication is important. Whether the provider is male or female, or communicates in a masculine or feminine way, and whether the patient communicates in a masculine or feminine way. I may communicate, even though I, I present as a woman, I may c communicate more in a masculine way. So it's really not as much about that role but how you communicate and that's very important and so we need to be we need to be very culturally sensitive when we're evaluating patients for any type of disease so I'll just say that and I will say it's important that we teach this in our medical school so if anyone is interested we do have a national sex and gender health education summit in April at the University of Utah through uh, some national academic organizations and British just to, to uh, respond to what you are doing with Cornell, which is amazing as well. We've, at, at Texas Tech University, have, have, they've created five modules and an entire repository of sex and gender um, resources that are open source. So if you uh, wish to um, visit that site, there are a lot of resources there. So education is important. All of this research, if we don't teach it to mm -hmm. the provider, will mm -hmm. never save a life. So that's, mm -hmm. that's first and foremost. And the second thing is that um, actually women are well represented in several cardiovascular disease areas. And we just completed a decadal review at FDA of 34 cardiovascular drugs that were approved from 2006 through 2016. It's in press now, that publication. And we found that over five cardiovascular disease processes like um, angina and uh, atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, that women were well represented in many of those areas. There were still some where they are underrepresented, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation. So we do need to figure out how we can get women in the pipeline for those disease processes. And so that is quite important that we, I think the overarching story is that we need to empower women and engage women and encourage women to participate in clinical trials. Online audience question? I think we'll take one more and then I know we have to wrap up. Um, and we've had a lot of questions about lifestyle factors. So um, here's one, the protective function of exercise as related to preventing depression and heart disease is well documented. Are these both disease, these are both diseases that impact women much more than men as you've discussed. Are you aware of any studies that have been done on exercise specifically as related to the differences between the sexes and how the benefits might differ for men and women? 
Well, oh, I'm sorry. Well, we Go know ahead. one one thing, and, and Marjorie, you'll correct me if I, I mess this up, but, but let me share something around AFib. Um, I think a study came out about a year, about two years ago, um, whereas originally we didn't understand with AFib men and women, should you exercise, should you not exercise? I'll simplify. It turns out for women, if you exercise, it's helpful, but for men, if you exercise, it's not helpful. That's the lay example. Great classic study that looked at sex differences with one condition, and we figured out it matters, and exercise is more beneficial for women if they have AFib and not for men. So it's a clear, concrete example. And a great example of where we have to teach that to our upcoming providers, right? So they know who to, how to counsel their patients. So I was going to make a comment actually about how uh, both the depression and the cardiovascular in, in response to physical exercise. In fact, there are animal studies that have looked at the role of exercise in actually increasing nerve cells, brain-derived nerve growth factor, okay? So, so things that help nerve cells grow in a specific region of the brain that's involved with mood, that's involved with stress response, and actually that's involved with memory, called the hippocampus. <clears throat> and in fact, they have shown physical activity actually affecting this. That particular brain region is one of the most highly sexually dimorphic brain regions in the brain. That is, it develops in different ways in the male and female human, uh, and actually it acts differently across the lifespan after puberty. So uh, actually understanding kind of the stress circuitry, which is something we study, sort of looking at um, both things like adverse childhood exposures that uh, one uh, questioner had asked or other aspects of, of the stress response actually, how uh, activity, uh, stress, um, mood, how these interact, and also in terms of how they regulate um, food intake um, and food motivation intake actually are all highly related to each other. Great, thank you. Thank um, you so much. So in the last um, couple of minutes, we <coughs> are uh, going to do our lightning round. Let mm -hmm. me ask each of our panelists, um, starting with Marjorie, please, um, what takeaway you would like um, policymakers to have from our discussion? Well, first and foremost, we have two basic human variables we've discussed here today for the past hour. We all have them without fail, sex and gender. And so we need to incorporate them into all of our scientific platforms. We need to ensure that we analyze the data and we, we need to then apply that across the clinical and healthcare delivery system to ensure that we are achieving personalized medicine. And I would just say that um, our FDA is, is very committed to this. Our Office of Women's Health is committed to advocating and educating and innovating across the agency and externally with our uh, many stakeholders. And really the bottom line is absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And if science doesn't have the data, we can't find the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Jill. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful panel, and I feel honored to be part of it. Um, I would say I'm going to take off from what Dr. Jenkins said and really move into translation, a little more into translation, uh, that we need to incorporate our understanding of sex differences. We actually have a lot of information right now that we could translate into clinical therapeutics, into thinking about healthcare systems differently in how we deliver it, so the impact of gender uh, as well as sex in, in the therapeutics, uh, and also towards policy and education of, of both the next generation in medicine and, and also the public, because the public plays a really important role in both uh, publicizing the importance and, and demanding uh, from your physicians as well and your healthcare providers uh, to, to learn about these things, um, but training the next generation um, and, and also public, public awareness. And as I said before, I think I'd just like to leave you with the fact that there is all this talk about precision medicine and personalized medicine. We need to incorporate the impact of sex. Because as I said before, what could be more personal or individualized? than Thank you. one sex. Thank you. Anna. Thank you. 
The global health community <coughs> needs to do much more uh, to improve women's health. Uh, disaggregating data by sex is essential. We talked a lot about that. Uh, it's also important to have that data disaggregated in vital statistics and in clinical records that uh, not always is available. Uh, but we, uh, and we need to focus on women's health along the life course. Uh, but we also need to uh, pay more attention to women as healthcare providers. British offered a wonderful example of how important it was to involve in nurses in, uh, in your efforts in Nashville. And women, well, 99% of nurses are women, and, ner and women also take care of their families and their relatives, and they are the, the first contact with the healthcare system at the domestic level. But they, that kind of role is often uh, invisible, uh, very, very, not, very much not recognized, obviously not remunerated. So we need to work on both sides of the equation, women as bearers of health issues and women as healthcare providers. And that will have a synergistic effect on women's health and status. Great. British. Sure. Thank you. Um, so thank you for, for hosting this event. A, a couple of things, three things. One is that we need more specific sex, uh, sex specific uh, research. But more importantly, we cannot forget this disease is 80% manageable or preventable. So we've got to continue to go upstream. The second thing is being an education and awareness initiative. We want to create a national movement and we ask people to join us. It's going to require every sector federal government, state government, local government, a holistic health systems approach. But we need to create a national movement like what we've seen with HIV and AIDS, although it's an infectious disease, and also with breast cancer. There's a lot to be learned from both of those uh, campaigns. And my last point is on the translational research issue. Translational research is critical if we want to see cures live in our communities, and we want to see be better health outcomes, and we want to save more lives. So important that we translate our cures and translate our, our, our efforts. That's a great message to end on. Um, thank you to all thank of the you panelists. You've been much. terrific. Thank you to the audience here and remotely. And please let re me remind you that the next forum will tackle extreme hurricanes, the challenges for Puerto Rico and beyond. That is on March 9th, noon to 1 p.m. Eastern. More information at forumhsph.org. Thank you again.